It's the same hustle, it's the same pain The same tears on the replay Maybe one day we will see We're one big family Like it's one channel It's the same sunshine, it's the same rain Educated, educate the public of the omitted history of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Specifically, right now we're dealing with the dark-skinned indigenous peoples of the southeastern portions of the United States. Colonization periods. Particularly, we must pay attention to definitions of terminologies and how these definitions and uh, the terminologies will change. For instance, mulatto, which have gone through about seven different um, definition changes over the course of the past maybe two to three hundred years. And so it really matters what terms we're using and what time reference we are using when we're using these terminologies. For instance, if we're saying that we're a mulatto today, we're black and white. In the 1900s, it was an, a native and an African. You know, before that it was, an, or in the 1800s it was a native and African. Before that it was an, any foreigner and any native woman. And so uh, it really, that one, that one was after, okay. So it's, it's many different definitions, it matters. Be and the reason why it matters is because these are the terms that we are using to classify or identify ourselves. And even if no one else used them, I'm sorry, even if we're not using them to identify ourselves, others have. And so we, we have to make sure that we understand what they were trying to do, what they were uh, um, trying to cover up, if anything, that they were covering up, and what did it do to us? What are the ramifications of allowing other people to identify us? And, and when it comes down to it, you know, you allow other people to control you. If you allow someone to categorize or identify you, then you are allowing them to set the standards by which they will, from here on out, identify you, the, the definitions and, and, and who you are as a person. Okay, thank you. And uh, again, I would also like to welcome you to uh, our presentation, Revealing America's Dark Skin Pass. Uh, hopefully you will be hearing information that you have not heard before. Uh, hopefully you will be seeing some images that you may not have seen before. In our title, we have America's dark-skinned past. Okay, and notice that we have dark skin, it didn't say black. And there, there's a definite reason for that. That's because black is really a new, it's a social construct that has just been created recently, okay? Uh, and that is because of when America or when the United States was being formulated, all of these little constructs, social constructs started to develop. And one of the things is labeling these dark-skinned people and giving them another name than what they originally were, okay? Before the Europeans arrived, there was no race. Race, there was no such thing as race. Race did not exist. Now, people were identified by their skin color. So it could have been this light-skinned person, this olive person, a dark-skinned person, this brown person. But again, it was just an identifier. It was not something that defined who you were. It did not define ethnicity. It did not define your ancestry. It was just an identifier. And it wasn't really until the 1700s was when this concept of race really started developing. And again, you'll see that that is right in line when the, United, when the British started taking over here in the United States and started developing these uh, racial norms. Okay, what <laughs> but uh, it, it definitely isn't normal. All right, so as we're learning these things, we need to take race out of the equation. Because a lot of times when we hear race or when we hear black, we get emotional about that. Okay. We get emotional about that terminology black or the terminology negro. You know, we hear negro and then, you know, something happens to us. You know, <laughs> and the thing is, is that we need to take all of that out when we are learning some new material. 
because when you're learning, you can't have your emotions in the learning process because emotions will stop learning. So as you learn, as, as you're watching these things, make, try to keep, if you start getting some emotions, you know, try to put them in check, okay? Because again, this, and again, that was the reason for developing those things, to develop those emotions in us. You know, so that we would feel a certain way when we see that African slave trade, uh, that ship, okay, which was really totally propaganda. That, that, that picture is total propaganda. But people don't realize that that was propaganda. It was, is, that picture is not a real picture, all right? It does not depict how the people were brought over here. It was a propaganda piece to raise your emotions so that you would get emotional, and then when, you're, you, when you raise your emotions, your decisions that you make are not the best decisions. Propaganda is information, ideas, or rumors deliberately spread widely to help or harm a person, group, movement, etc. A word that had just been introduced into the English vocabulary in the early 18th century, but by the end of the century, abolitionists were using this tactic widely as it provided results. At the end of the 18th century, slavery had become a very hot topic in politics here and abroad. While the newly forming United States depended on slavery to fund the colonies, abolitionist views were becoming more widespread and abolitionist subcultures began to emerge. One such group was the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade a British abolitionist group formed in May of 1787 in London, England. The society worked to educate the public about the abuses of the slave trade by writing and publishing anti-slavery books and pamphlets and creating abolitionist prints and posters. Their most infamous print is the image of the Brooks, an 18th century British slave ship. The Plymouth chapter of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade acquired detailed measurements of the Brooks, including deck plans, cross sections, and side views. The abolitionists inserted images of prone black people to demonstrate the possibility of how they could be situated. It was a hypothetical illustration, an image that requires one to think what life is like when people are stored this way. It was an image that could carry its message into the minds of those who did not read the society's literature. Images had rarely been used as a propaganda tool in this way before. This image became one of the first political posters. This propaganda was so effective that it has lasted for centuries. It has sparked our imaginations to create images like this. It has also allowed our psyches to be so empathetic to African slavery that it clouds the fact that only 5% of the African slave trade actually took place on United States soil. Now, when we're talking about the arrival when these Europeans arrived here. They arrived to people that were all really all different complexions. When Columbus was coming over, he knew that he was going to be running into people of color. He knew that because he brought along things that he was trading with the people. Now, in Columbus's logs, very first log, it doesn't say that he was going to try to prove that the world was round. That was not an agenda. They already knew at that time that the world was round. They already knew that. That's why Christopher Columbus was trying to sail west to get to the Indies, because going east to the Indies from Spain, or from, from, the, uh, from that penin the Iberian Peninsula, going east from that point was totally blocked by the Moors. The Moors had everything blocked. They could not get through to India. Okay, so they had to find a different way because they had to keep paying taxes as they were going through. They didn't want to do that anymore. So they wanted to find another route. So that was the purpose, to find India by traveling west. 
And they, what they didn't realize is that there was a big continent in the middle. Now, the Europeans didn't know that, all right? The Chinese knew that, though, because they developed a world map in the uh, early 1400s that, was, that showed all of the continents that were very accurate. And that was in the early 1400s. So they knew that what that, you know, they knew that this continent was there. The Europeans were the ones that were really the ones that were just, you know, they're out of the loop. They, they just didn't know, okay? But they knew that they were going to be running into dark-skinned people. Why? Because they were going to India. And what did the people look like in India? They were brown-skinned people. So they took the things with them to trade. So that when they got to the people, that they would have things to trade with and to make friends with these people, find out what their demeanor is, so that when they come back, they can figure out what they're going to do next. Okay, so when the Europeans finally did arrive here, they arrived to a, to, to a place that had all different colors of people. Okay, now this is a picture that was, I believe it is a Mayan picture, so it is from, I do believe, the Yucatan Peninsula. And you will see that there are all different colored people. Here's a light-skinned person. Here's one who's a little bit browner. We have another one that's a little bit browner still darker still, and we even have a little blue black person up there, <laughs> okay? But again, this is just showing what was here in the Americas already, all right? People of all different complexions. However, when we get here to, you know, and when we start learning our history, this is the image that we now believe that the American Indians, or the Native Americans, or the Indigenous Americans, that's what we think that they look like. So now, how did this happen? Why, you know, why do we now think that this was the only complexion? And that is because a new image had to be created. You know, the United States was trying to create this black, white society. And so they had to take these people of color that were here, and they had to either put them in one category or the other category. They could either be white or they could be black. There was no in-betweens. And so this is what happened. And the biggest thing that happened is the slave trade and what happened during the slave trade. Now, this is a map, of course, that is of the transatlantic slave trade. Now, you notice they have changed the name of that from the African slave trade to the transatlantic slave trade. And there's a few reasons why. One reason is that all the slaves weren't African. So they couldn't call it the African slave trade. But we will never find that out unless you do some research. There were people that were coming from India that were, uh, that were slaves. There were people that were coming from Madagascar. They were, com they were really coming from all over the world that were coming into the United States as slaves. There were white people that were coming as slaves. The Scots. A lot of Scots and Irish were brought into the Americas as slaves. So it wasn't just the African slave trade. So now that's why they call it now the transatlantic slave trade. However, when you pull up the transatlantic slave trade, what comes up? Maps like this. Okay. Now, this map is, is showing, again, the wider numbers are showing where the wider bands are showing the larger numbers of people that were being tr that transported. And you see this is the largest area which was coming from West Central Africa. But notice that there were even people coming from Southeast Africa. There were people that were coming from Madagascar. At least that's what they're showing on this map because this is you know, the map of Africa that they're showing. And, uh, and again, there were people that were coming from all over here in all over areas. And, but I want you to notice where these lines are ending up. Now notice where these lines are ending up. A very large went down here to South America, but look at the lines up here where the United States. The lines are very, very thin. And they're thin because there were not that many Africans that were brought directly to the United States. It wasn't that many at all. Now this is a, um, this is a chart here 
uh, we got it from slavevoyages.org, which is a website that uh, Emory University, which is one of those Ivy League schools that is down in Atlanta, that is a that has participated with them in a lot of different companies to try to get down to the facts of the slave trade and, and of the uh, transatlantic slave trade. These numbers have changed. If I, have, if I had shown you a chart from when I first went there, these numbers here, which is the total number, they have 12 million here, the 12, uh, 12 million uh, slaves that were brought from Africa. On the first chart, they only had 9 million. So that number has gotten bigger. And another number is this number right here, which is showing the United States and the numbers that came to the United States. At first, these numbers were close to 500,000. They had them down to 300,000. Only 300,000 Africans were brought to the United States. Now, it's like, well, wait a minute. Why are they, you know, why do we get confused about these numbers? Well, one thing is, again, is the wordplay. They, they will say, oh, 12 million slaves were brought to, to the Americas, or were brought to America. And that is true. 12 million slaves were brought to America. But we have to understand that America and the United States is two different things. Two different things. And so as we are reading our history, again, we have to realize all these little nuances that, are, that is in the writing, that if you don't pay attention to it, you will miss it. And most people miss that America and United States thing. They just, they, they miss that. There's some other things I'm going to point out also that we just have to pay attention to because if we don't, we'll just go right by it. So, now these numbers here that, uh, that they're showing, um, and I just want to point out a couple of numbers to you. The first thing is this number up to 1800. I totaled all of these right here from, uh, from when they first started bringing Africans to the shores of the United States down to 1800. That added up to about 193,000, okay? Which means that up until 1800, only 193,000 Africans were brought to the shores of the United States. That's, that's really not that many. I looked it up and right now that is the um, the, 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 the entire city of Erie, Pennsylvania <laughs> is 193,000. So again, that's all of, that was brought over here from Africa up until 1800. Now, another thing is this, is that we have to realize that with those numbers, that two thirds of those numbers were African males, all right? One third of the cargo was children and females. If we only did, there were 22% children. If we only did the females, only 14% of those people were females. Who's making all the slaves if there's only, and, and that number came up to 26,000. 26,000 females. How are they going to be making all these slaves that were in the United States? Who were these people who were making all of these babies to provide slaves for the United States? And the United States was the only place where we were making our slaves here. That's why the numbers are much smaller, because we were growing our own slaves right here. But who were the people that they were using? They were utilizing the indigenous people here. How else could they come up with these large numbers? So again, up until 1800, remember only 193,000. Notice from 1800 to the end of uh, slavery, notice the numbers there. It's only about 111,000 Africans that were brought in the 1800s to the United States. In actuality, it had been outlawed. Okay, and that's that Juneteenth thing. <laughs> it was outlawed, but they were still bringing them in. Uh, but you see the numbers diminished, okay, where it was only 100, maybe 110,000 that came to the United States during that time. Let's look at the next numbers though. Watch this. This is the slave population in the United States. Notice in 1800. Notice where they have them, at almost a million slaves in the United States in, 18, in 1800. Now remember, only 193,000 from the beginning of them bringing them here, over 100 years. And, uh, you know, but still, this is the number that they have. I'll say that's close to about 900,000, all right? But remember that from 1800 
1866 that only 100,000 slaves were brought. But look at the number, 4 million slaves. Where did that number come from? And remember, most of the slave trade were African males. Who were they mating with? They were mating with the indigenous people because again, when the females were coming over, they had to acclimate to uh, totally, they're riding on a boat for three months, which is going to knock your system totally out of whack. Okay, and most of the females, when they came over, they were not able to bear children. That's what happened in the other countries, all right? That's why they had to keep bringing slaves into the other countries. The children, they, they weren't doing what the United States was doing. The United States was making sure that they had the slave population by creating that slave population, which is what they did, by blending these African people in with the Native Americans. The Native Americans didn't have any problem with it. They became part of the family. And again, because the females were the ones that were bearing the children, then they were definitely indigenous or native to the land. Okay? So let's go on. <clears throat> so now, then we may, uh, we may then say, okay, now, when did dark-skinned people come here to the Americas then? When did they first arrive? But again, I say the better question is, when did people arrive to the Americas? Because again, remember, there is no such thing as race, all right? When you had the, uh, the, uh, the migrations, which we are about to show a map of that now. When they arrived over in Asia, they no longer called the people Africans. They were Asians at that point. When they reached India and started to develop, they, they weren't called, that they were called Indians. When they reached Australia, they became Australians. Okay, so of course then when they reach the America, they should be Americans. Okay, why do they now, you know, why, why, you know, why, why do now when they reached America that now black people have to say, oh, we're, we're African American. They don't say African Asian. They don't say African Indian. You know, they don't say African Australian. You know, so why do we have to claim that when you come here again? That's that emotional thing that they're trying to put into you. You know, so again, we got to take those emotions out. But again, now, with this migration, and again, it's a theory, all right? Theories are guesses. This is a theory that was developed in the, um, in the 1700s, early 1700s. And it really hasn't changed much since then. And that's ridiculous that it hasn't changed much, especially today with the information that they have today. But they still have not changed this theory because it was something that they developed and they don't want to change it. They don't want to change this theory. And so anytime they develop a theory and it stays in the books for a long time, you know, there's an old saying, when the fiction becomes the truth, teach the fiction. <laughs> okay, so now, this fiction now has become truth and so this is what they teach. That was the line that was uh, a John Wayne line in. Uh, a movie, <laughs> Who Shot Liberty Valance, I think it was that movie. Yeah, but that was a line, but, that, that is, but that's what history has become, you know? It's become a lie that, that they just continually, cre you know, say, and we started to believe it. Now, so again, the Af they're showing these people, the, they said the early humans left out of here around 100,000 years ago. They reached Asia, let's say around 50,000 years ago. They venture on down to Australia, which is 40,000 years ago. And then they say on across Beringia, okay, it is a strait now, but back then it was a tire landmass. So this, these lines here are the lines of what the landmass was, and that was all ice, okay? So when the ice melted, the ice caps melted, and then it exposed the land, and so now that's why that's a strait now. But it was, it, it was a land bridge uh, at that time. And then, so, of course, you're coming on into the Americas. Notice they have, by 12,000, they've gotten down past the ice caps into the Americas and then on down and into South America by 10,000 or 11,000 years ago. Okay, now, this is a theory that they have developed. Again, it has been told over and over and over again. This is the story that we have heard. However, guess what? There are some problems with this. First, again, there's the Beringia. They had them coming across, across, and they said that there was a little land bridge that was an ice-free corridor 
made it down into here. And this is an area, Folsom and Clovis is uh, in New Mexico, and this is an area where they first started finding Native American tools. Okay, so they named the tools their Clovis tools. And then they called the first people Clovis people. Now again, these are people that first arrived across the Bering Strait. However, <clears throat> again, now these are some of the tools that they had. These again were called Clovis points. Now the problem is, is that they have run into points or tools that are older than Clovis. Most of these points are on the eastern side of the Americas. Today's topic is blood and native identity. In 1897, the Smithsonian Institute's Bureau of American Ethnology wrote in its annual report that, and I quote, the blood of the Southern Negro is unquestionably Indian, end quote. The Bureau, whose focus was on North American Indian cultures, was established in 1879 by Congress. According to the Bureau, and I quote the full quote, as the coast tribes dwindled, they were compelled to associate and intermarry with Negroes until they finally lost their identity and were classed with that race so that a considerable portion of the blood of the Southern Negro is unquestionably Indian, end quote. So you may ask, if it was known that the blood of Southern Negroes was unquestionably Indian, and Indian blood is what defines who an American Indian is, why is it difficult for dark-skinned people to claim their native identity? The answer lies in colonial laws, which made slave blood negate Indian blood.